Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, Beehives, Forging a Strong Connection Between Commercial Properties and Healthy Human Habitat. I'm Noah Wilson-Rich, the founding partner and chief scientific officer of The Best Bees Company, the largest beekeeping service in the United States. Thanks for joining our webinar today. We have a great lineup. This webinar is about change. You'll learn what leading organizations are doing to adapt in what feels like an ever-changing climate. They're deepening connections between sustainability initiatives that draw and retain tenants while also promoting healthy living and a healthy economy. So first, we want to know a little bit more about you. Who's joining us today? It's great to see in the chat room where everybody's from. I love seeing our big community in Chicago and San Francisco. I know you guys are in attendance, plus our Northeast Corridor. You guys are also really well represented here, all the way out to our Pacific Coast communities and also some international people. So it's great to be together. Thanks again for joining. We're going to open up a poll now to get a feel for who you are and, uh, and to see what we've got in the audience today, who's here. So please let us know some of these of the following. Let's see. Okay, which of the following best describes your role? And do you have beehives? So let us know what you think. Take a moment. And then we'll get some feedback here. While we take a moment to let everybody respond, I'll make a quick housekeeping note. If you have a question for us during the presentation, it may get overlooked if you post that in the chat. So using Zoom, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen instead. We'll do our best to answer your questions live or with a written response. Okay, here are some of these responses so we can learn about each other. Pretty good. In this new world, companies are shifting. We're pivoting and adapting to changing times and all toward a sustainable future that is safe and inclusive for everybody. We're in a new time and new ideas are exactly the kind of successes and wins that are gonna help set real estate companies apart as well as other companies as well. Consider transforming spaces from gray to green as we call it or turning unused corners of rooftops into something that makes a positive impact for the whole community. Go farther and even start calling these amenity decks, amenity spaces, promoting wellness and healthy living. And now you've got an improved asset that just so happens to also save the world. Urban beekeeping is an emerging and increasingly common sustainability element that top real estate assets are including across wide portfolios. We've scheduled this webinar in celebration of what's called National Pollinator Week, which is a thing. It's a big deal for us in the beekeeping business, of course, but maybe you're not so familiar with it. So what does that mean and why do we even have it? Well, 13 years ago, the US Senate unanimously des designated a week in June as National Pollinator Week. Bees have always earned bipartisan support, and that's something that definitely comes in handy when working with the real estate community. This marked a necessary step towards addressing the urgent need of declining pollinator populations. Pollinator Week has now grown into an international celebration of the valuable ecosystem services that are provided by bees, birds, butterflies, bats, beetles, a lot of B words there, but it's really important. If you happen to see buildings lit up in yellow and orange this week, it's in support of National Pollinator Week. All Pollinator Week events are around the US and they're virtual this year. So thanks for joining our virtual event in support of this important week. Let me introduce our two guest speakers without further ado. First is Megan Calabrese, dialing in from Boston. Megan is the Director of Property Management of Fox Rock Properties. She oversees all operational, financial, and strategic functions within Fox Rock's Property Management Division. Megan leads a team of property managers, building engineers, and support staff to provide best-in-class service to Fox Rock tenants. Megan is a member of Boston's South Shore Chamber of Commerce, BOMA, and NIOP. Welcome to Megan. Thanks, Noah, excited to be here. Yeah. Next is Guttam Tarafdar, joining us from Virginia. Guttam is the Regional Executive for Market Transformation and Development across the Mid-Atlantic and New England regions at the U.S. Green Building Council. Guttam works with the Green Building's industry's top companies in the U.S. Northeast Corridor, leading market transformation initiatives to create positive impact in the areas of human health and wellness, resilience, and social equity, which is more important these days than ever, perhaps. His work with clients, stakeholders, communities, and volunteers all strengthens sustainability outreach, focusing on commitment as well as engagement. 
Throughout an awareness events, Guttam brings diverse groups together to find common ground. So thank you and welcome, Guttam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this event. So excited to have you both here. So we hope that what we share with you today will shift your perspective and that it will inspire you to take some action. Here's what we've got planned. First, I'm going to share with you the June 2020 State of the Bees update, including how this pandemic and these Black Lives Matter protests have impacted bees and sustainability. Uh, they continue to need, to need us, and we continue to need bees. Then, Megan's going to tell a great story about how Fox Rock Properties spent this spring installing beehives on 10 of their rooftops, and why it's such an important initiative as they connect with their community. After that, we'll learn more about how Guttam and the USGBC is supporting companies with initiatives like LEED certification. He'll share several LEED projects that incorporate honeybees into their sustainability programs. Along the way, we want to hear from you. So another reminder, type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom. Shelly, who we can see as our godlike bee in the corner here, will provide a voice and be monitoring the Q&A and helping to make sure that everyone's questions are answered. We've got a few more polls. So in fact, let's do another one right now. On a scale of one to five, how would you rate the connection between your office building and your local community? So take a moment here. All right, once you've got the polls tabulating, we're gonna have Shelly read out the results. Thanks, Now we have about 45, 50% voted. I'll wait another couple seconds to make sure everyone has a chance to type in their answer and submit. Okay. It looks like we have uh, the majority, about 33% of attendees rate themselves at around a three, doing a few things with the local communities. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. So now let's talk about how the bees are doing. The spring is when my team at Best Bees does most of our installations of beehives, both at residential and commercial properties, which means that we're bringing bees onto the properties as well as their hives that we build by hand. COVID-19, of course, has disrupted this process and it's caused delays. As we figure out how to do this essential work, we're also trying to figure out how to make sure that everyone connected stays involved and protected. This required flexibility, but it worked. And now we've installed over 10 million new pollinators across our 12 US cities and their suburbs this spring alone. 10 million bees, it's been an amazing year. Our colony numbers are up actually. Demand for corporate and residential beehives is holding strong and our research that we use each beehive for is progressing. Typically, all our new bees would be in their homes by now but they aren't. So we still need about 50 to 100 more beehives, and in particular for a special collaboration we've got with MIT that advances a project that we call the Synthetic Apiary. It's originally been funded by the Tokyo Olympics team, and we all know of all the crazy COVID impacts on our lives as well as with the Olympics. So we're continuing in a new, exciting, but a different direction with this. Also, we've got a newfound flexibility. That means that our team can now install beehives in new locations, even now and through the summer. So this is part of how we're, we're flexible and we're expanding the beekeeping season. Another positive note for us is that the season's been above average for bee health. The environment is doing pretty good right now. We've already harvested honey from coast to coast, and that's pretty unusual for June. In fact, our New England honey tastes like berries. Have you ever had a berry honey before? In San Francisco, we're even donating this extra honey back to an urban farming collective that's going towards supporting food insecurity relating to the economy, relating to protests for Black Lives Matter. It's a great way to connect with the real estate industry, with our communities to make a real impact in a way that also helps the environment. What's the same? Well, pollinators are still in trouble. Unfortunately, we're waiting on the latest data from the 2019 to 2020 beehive survival, but we anticipate that it's going to remain the same around 40% death across all beehives nationwide yet again. It's untenable. With our bee research, we're able to use data from each and every one of our beehives, got over a thousand of them these days, and we're learning all the time about what harms bees and what makes them thrive. For anyone who's ever taken a train from Boston to New York, for example, when you look out from the train over all of those empty rooftops, you see nothingness. 
that infuriates me. The change that we need is towards green rooftops, veggie gardens, playgrounds, or other similar amenities, especially given that these save money through lower HVAC costs. So companies are helping. Think about all of the unused space at your properties, empty corners of rooftops, shady areas on grounds, large commercial and residential buildings, building owners, tenants, property managers, we're all important partners to the pollinators. Why is that? Well, because they're incentivized to seek sustainability with ratings like LEED. We're seeing tenancy trends in millennials with attitudes that shape where they want to live and work towards more sustainable properties. We're hearing more investor demands for corporate social responsibility, CSR, and environmental, social, and governance requirements, ESG goals. These are extremely common in Europe and picking up fast here in the United States. These buildings often have space and capacity to really scale in a way that moves the needle. Fox Rock, for example, as I mentioned, has 10 buildings now where they're pollinators in locations where there weren't any beehives before in the whole community. Thus, Fox Rock is making a real impact. A lot of times, once a property has bees, the property owners, the managers, and the tenants all become more aware of bees. This opens up the conversation in a much more positive way than some people might expect. There's more education, there's greater awareness, and there's ecological awareness. So that hopefully leads to more action. Let's do another poll. Which of the following here applies to you? Take a moment here. While we wait for the poll results to come in, Noah, there are a couple of questions I could throw at you. Yeah, uh, one that. from Joe, he had a beehive for about three months. Unfortunately, they absconded. Can you explain some of the reasons why? Yes, so when a, a beehive absconds, it is um, kind of the opposite. So with my team at Best Bees, we'll bring the bees and the beehive and we install them. It's not like a bird box or maybe some of you have bat hotels or bat houses. Bats eat mosquitoes. Bird boxes, bat houses, you have to wait for them to come. With a beehive, we bring the bees. When a beehive absconds, the bees leave and it's an empty beehive. Kind of similar to what we started seeing in 2006, the colony collapse disorder. It's very mysterious and oftentimes people think the bees have just died, but in fact, they just moved to a new home. Our research with the synthetic apiary project with MIT actually put beehives in a warehouse over the winter time. And we found that two beehives that absconded, those bees were still alive and intact just in another corner of the warehouse. So even if you don't know where your bees went, you can take some solace in knowing that you just provided your neighborhood with some more pollinators that are likely living in a hole in a tree. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I just shared the results. It looks like about half of our attendees today uh, put their sustainability efforts into their home and a third have an emphasis on the horizon mm. on sustainability for their organization. That's great. There's such a blurred line these days between home and organization. So it makes sense that we're doing sustainability things in both places. So for the Best Bees Company and myself, we've been around for 10 years doing this. Our work with businesses like commercial real estate companies and with homeowners, it's all installed thousands of beehives over the years across the US. We fully manage those and we gather scientific data about how the bees are doing. So using the Best Bees Company's own proprietary software, we write our own code, my team has compiled one of the largest data sets in the world about bee health. So we've got an ebook called Why Bees Matter, and I'd love to share this with you. It's full of information that I hope will help you, everybody, to get involved with how to save the bees. We'd like to post a link to it now as a thank you for attending today. Adding beehives, it's a small investment with a massive payoff or an outsized impact as we like to call it. When beehives are connected to data sets, each box of bees, it's actually a living data factory, a bio indicator of ecosystem health. It's vitally important for our ongoing research. We need and celebrate everyone who gets involved, whether as a citizen scientist or as a business minded sustainability champion. As our speakers describe their experiences today, you'll get a sense for what other rewards bees bring, such as lead points, increased tenant engagement, health, and wellness. Now I'll turn it over to Megan Calabrese of Fox Rock Properties. I love this story because they heard the call of the pollinators and made it happen, even during a difficult period. They're a great example of innovative building owners who are using beehives to improve the tenant's experience and to help with tenant retention. 
I mean, who doesn't want a little jar of honey to help connect them to their properties? Home sweet home honey. So Megan, please go ahead and open up your slides and tell us what you've been working on. Awesome. Thanks, Noah. And thanks to the Best Bees team for having us um, here today. We're excited to kind of share our story. Uh, go right into it. Where is, as I was so excited, I closed my slides. Give me one second, sorry. All good, Shelly, do you want, do you have another question? Sure, uh, Genesee asks if MIT needs volunteer locations. If so, how can we volunteer to participate? Yes, yeah, it's amazing. So we partner up with NASA, TED, National Geographic, MIT, Harvard. I mean, any type of organization that's willing to partner is great and then it just grows. So we're looking actually for space for about 50 to 100 new beehives for our ongoing research project with MIT. Definitely feel welcome to reach out to us um, at bestbees.com. There's a great forum there. All right. All right, Megan, thank you. Sure, yeah, sorry about that. All right. Um, as Noah had mentioned, my name is Megan Calabrese. I'm the Director of Property Management for Fox Rock Properties. Um, we engaged in uh, the Best Bees program just this year and admittedly, I did not know as much as I do now about bees. So it was um, interesting to learn more, not about their, just about their company, but how we could actually bring this program to our buildings. So Fox Rock Properties, we are a private real estate investment company. Um, we're owned by the Hale family. We have about three and a half million square feet of commercial Real estate now, it's a, it's a blend of office, medical, and industrial space, um, primarily in Massachusetts, uh, a little bit in Rhode Island, and down in Florida. So uh, a lot of suburban office parks, a little bit of urban um, commercial office buildings right now. We are also developers embarking on quite a few projects in, in Quincy um, over the next couple of years. We'll probably have about three shovel-ready projects in 2020 and into 2021. We're excited to kind of help revitalize um, Quincy in the coming years. So one of the benefits of being local owners is um, we pride ourselves in investing in the communities that we also um, are buying properties in. If we, you know, it's, it's great to develop and own real estate, but if we don't, if the communities around us don't thrive as well, what good are these big buildings that we're, that we're putting into these um, cities and the local towns? So we like to partner with our communities. We like to really dig in and find out what the needs are um, of, the, of those communities and, and help as best that we can. Um, one second, we just gotta, you still see the first screen, right? There we go, okay. So, um, as I mentioned, um, we've got a big local focus on the communities that we invest in. We've actually even started a, um, a philanthropic arm that we call Fox Rock Cares. So, we started this a couple years ago, really formed the program um, with some more team coming on board in the last couple of years. We find um, you know, the, the people that need it the most within the communities that we invest, whether it's a monetary contribution or even more so we love our days of service where we utilize our skilled staff among the, the property managers and the engineers and really try to put them to work to help whether it's rebuilding playgrounds or helping nonprofit preschools get you know, funding or help that they normally wouldn't have, um, healthcare facilities and of the five arms that we um, focus on, youth development, education, health and wellness, um, cultural, cultural enrichment, and uh, environmental conservation, when we started looking into the best, best bees program, we realized we could kind of beef up that environmental piece and sustainability piece um, and bring this program to not only our tenants, but hopefully eventually the community and um, give them a little bit more not only information, but maybe some honey and some bring this program to some of the suburban environments that we are in. So um, that's, that's kind of uh, where we looked at this first from a community standpoint, and then also just kind of learning as we learned more about the, the bee program and understanding um, you know, the need to really expand their search area into the suburban markets, it seemed like a good fit. So, all right, why best bees? Um, as many of you on this webinar know, as property owners, we, we look to meet and uh, the expectations of our tenants and surpass them at many times. We try to minimize the potential risk at the buildings. And I think, um, you know, whether you're seven or 70, the initial reaction to a bee is you run or you freak out, right? So that's a misconception now, you know, as I learn more about these bees and knowledge is power, we were bringing these programs and all different types of programs to the building 
but we have to make sure how is this going to be perceived from our tenants, right? So our biggest goal was to not only um, learn about the program, we want to bring these kind of sustainable, sustainable efforts to the buildings and not just check a box, um, but really di dive in. And, and if we're going to bring it to the tenants, we've got to learn everything about it. So Sam Jennings and, the, and Noah and the Best Bees team did a phenomenal job in a very short time period of training not only myself up, but my team up on what, what does this program mean? What does it look like? How does it even help? Um, what are the tenants going to think about it? How do we make sure nobody is worried about getting stung or you know, what potential impacts could come to the building? So knowledge is power, as we all know. And the, the team did a great job of, of um, kind of teaching us about the program and then quickly allowing us to roll this out in what I you know, perceive as a, as a pretty short period of time. So it seemed like a great uh, sustainable initiative as soon as we started learning more about it. And um, we we're excited to bring it to, as Noah mentioned, 10 of our, our properties, two hives, at each so we knew that part of this was if we didn't want to just check a box hide these on the roof and not have anybody know about it we engage with our tenants similar to our community um, we're long-term holder uh, holders of the real estate so we really pride ourselves on our tenant relations and we wanted to let them know about this program so we knew the messaging would be important the tenant involvement would be important so that's we're excited that um, you know we've got the installs behind us and now we can kind of roll into the production piece of it um, and then you know eventually have some honey for our tenants and our, our, our community to share so um, as I mentioned we I, I, coming into this I, I knew nothing about these one of my APMs worked at the Prudential Center previous to coming to Fox Rock and she they had some hives up there so she knew she knew some of some information about it which was great um, but I do have to say that you know Noah and Sam and his team really made us um, made us all believers so um, we can talk about the hive location. The, there we go. Sorry, I gotta keep up on my slides, am I talking? Um, so as we, we knew the program was gonna fit for our portfolio, we started to take a look at where, where's the best location, not just for us, we wanna optimize the program. Um, we wanna minimize any risk or potential impact to operations. As you all know, that's, that's a key um, factor when we're looking at different programs that we want to bring to the buildings. Um, so there's a balance there, right? So what do, what do the bees need and what do we need um, to be able to make this a successful, you know, partnership? And, um, you know, the first thought was the roofs, as Noah mentioned. A lot of them are bare other than mechanical equipment. Um, you're starting to see some, you know, gardens and, and different ideas up there, but um, it was really, you know, a no-brainer to put them up on the roof not that we're hiding them, but we we felt that any potential risk, which I've quickly learned, there's very very little, um, that would be a, a good location for them, for the beekeepers to be able to get access to them, and then for you know for those to be the hives to be up there for our team to allow them and work with the beekeepers to get um, you know the proper access that they would need once a month to you know maintain the the hives. So there's one location that we have it on the ground, um, especially in our suburban market, we have the benefit of space. We have a lot of parking lots, we have less space. So different than urban setting, we did put one on the ground, which you know, we're comfortable with and the tenants are all comfortable with. But other than that, we, we utilize the roofs. Um, for the real estate owners or managers on the call, there's the, you know, it's limited of what, you, what they really need, but access, uh, you know, a straight roof, uh, stairs right up to the roof um, and easy access is, is pretty much all they need. And then obviously an engineer or somebody to, to let them in. So. In terms of the general program, there's a, from our standpoint, there was a, what we felt a low barrier for entry. And of all the things that we manage, um, you know, this being just one small part of everything that goes into property management, it wasn't a heavy lift at all. Um, I'd say we got, and this is amidst a pandemic, um, we got everything that we needed to, from the Best Bees team, decided to, to do the rollout, chose the locations, and then the property managers and the engineers really worked with the B team just to get them up to the space, get the hives installed. Um, and it, it, again, it's, it's up there. It's a great program that I think the, the impact is a lot greater than what you would, you would perceive as any, you know, hardships to really rolling it out. So my team, um, it was two engineer, two, excuse me, two property managers and then the engineers for each building. But um, it, was a, it was a quick turn for a program we started talking about in January and we have all of our hives up and, and running. Um, and 
you know, again, like I said, we had to take a small pause for COVID, but we got four locations done, took a short pause. We're able to get it back up and running into the window pretty much of what the bees need for their, um, you know, optimal honey making. It's probably- Megan, more... <laughs> Megan a couple questions come in, have come sure. in about uh, how, educating your tenants or convincing people they won't get stung. You manage, you uh, mentioned kind of getting out ahead of complaints. How, how did you know that um, your tenants were comfortable with this and how did you manage expectations? Noah, Noah guaranteed me 100% that nobody would get stung. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, in all seriousness. So again, that, that's, um, as I joked, but it, the first thought when anybody thinks of a bee or when everybody sees a bee, it doesn't matter what kind it is, you, you stop, you freeze or you run. Um, depending on your age or your, you know, your awareness. But so that was a big thing that we, we talked about. We said, how do we make this, you know, comfortable to the level that people aren't going to think we're, we're now making them more, you know, bringing a risk to the building that we do not want to do. And again, education. So Noah explained to us, these bees are docile. They're, you know, I, I won't even pretend to go into the level of detail that they provided us. But anytime I had a question, Sam probably got back to me within a minute or the, the, beehive, the beekeepers themselves that were, talking with the engineers and the property managers as they were rolling them out. Kate, one of my property managers has pictures. She was there at the truck. She wanted to see how these hives come out and, you know, and, and took some photos and some video. It was pretty cool to be able to be part of that. But um, for us to give a comfort level to our tenants, we really had to dive in and make sure we understood what we were doing. Um, and, and, and we are, we're very comfortable that there's not more of a risk than if you were walking to the building um, because there's hives on your roofs or there's hives in your parking lot than you would be on a normal day. So there's, you know, obviously bees are out there. Um, I mean, no, you have, feel free to jump in if you got a little more specifics on that, which I know you will, but. Thank you. Take my job. You did it all. <laughs> it's great. I'm going to go make a sandwich. <laughs> so. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, no worries. Um, so again, as I mentioned, 10 properties that we identified, this is just a quick snapshot of where we put them, two hives on each. Um, we didn't, we kind of just picked roof access, larger parking lot if we were going to put it on the ground, but really focusing on the, the roof access um, and the roof location. Urban settings, that's where I think the, you know, primarily the, the program has really done well. We also learned as we started talking more and more that the suburban area and suburban environment doesn't have a ton of data. So we were happy to be able to partner and give some, you know, some suburban rooftops so that you can get more data points, um, NASA data points right now. Um, and it just kind of, it kind of worked out across our portfolio. So, you know, I'll get in, we'll talk about growth in a little bit, but we started here, but I could see this expanding. Um, you know, we've got, as I mentioned, three and a half million square feet with a, a with a large um, growth strategy in the coming years. Um, so as we look to purchase more real estate, I think this will be a program that we kind of roll out from, from the onset. Um, all right. So another cool Part to this is you can customize. We now own a farm, um, <laughs> at least a label that says we own a farm. Um, so customize labels. It's a it's kind of a cool feature. We're able to kind of make your own labels. You can even customize the beehives. The only caveat this year was due to COVID. Um, we ran into a couple um, hiccups there, but we plan to put a little Fox Rock Farms on on the hives in the future. Um, these four ounce jars of honey. This is what we will get at the end of our season and we'll be able to share these with our tenants with the community eventually maybe even use them in some of our cafes um, use them at a coffee shop with some honey for your for your tea or whatever um, the case may be but we we really you know as I mentioned want to share this with our tenants continue to um, you know talk to them about the program we did um, you know roll as we as we roll this out we try to communicate with them regularly on on new steps or things that they can do there's a couple of events that Best Bees offers as well. The tenants can come up, they can um, see the hive, they can learn about it, they can learn about the process. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to share some honey with the tenants. Uh, with our initial outreach to the tenants, I also learned that we have a, a beekeeper within our tenant family, which is great. So you never know um, until you ask those, those questions. So um, this is, yeah, so this is, so this is just a sample of what we sent out to our tenants. Again, I, I can't say enough, the Best Bees team, they really, they, they certainly know their subject well and they provide 
very uh, detailed information for us to be able to share with the tenants and to learn ourselves. So we took a lot from, um, from them. Marketing team did a phenomenal job of putting together some information to make it easy, easily readable to our tenants. Um, and then we, you know, we just kind of notified them of what, what the plan was when they, the, the hives were going in and then look for some future information as the, um, as the program rolls out and continues on and gets closer to the you know, time of the year when we, when we um, go get the honey from the hives. You know, we're, as Noah mentioned, you know, everything's shifting lately and amidst this pandemic in general, we, you know, as many real estate operators, we pride ourselves on our tenant relations and our tenant communication. And I think, you know, with heightened sensitivities already, communication was key. Um, we took a stance at the beginning of the pandemic that we needed to be transparent um, and, we, and I think we tried to do that as much as we could with COVID, with, with um, everything that was going on. And then we knew that introducing something else amongst this just had to have the right messaging. And it's all about the positive messaging. Um, you know, if, if we're excited about the program, which is why we learned so much about it, the tenants are gonna, you know, they're gonna follow suit and understand that this is something that, that's really great, not just for the buildings, but for the environment and for our pollinators that obviously need the help. So we, we kind of just made sure that, um, Answer, ask the questions, you know, answer, ask us whatever you want. We're, we're, we're ready to answer. If we can't get the answer, we knew Best Bees would give us, a, you know, a quick answer on anything that came up. Um, we got through the COVID-19. We introduced some murder hornets. I mean, what else could go wrong? So we, <laughs> you know, I joke, but we did, we did have to say, all right, is this going to be something that um, people are now going to be worried about? And within, you know, not even a half of a day, Noah had a great article. There's great knowledge about what that actually means. Media doesn't do us any favors. Um, so, you know, I'm getting headlines from like Fox News, nothing against Fox, but look at these murder hornets. Are you bringing these to our buildings? So you have to kind of understand what that actually means. And, um, you know, and we did, and we, we were able to have some quick answers, some great write-ups from uh, the Best Bees team. And we don't feel there's no, you know, risk of that at our buildings. And again, they've got the data, right? So if there's a murder hornet coming, it's like they're gonna be able to track it way before. <laughs> <laughs> way beforehand anyway so um but i did that just speaks to the point about communication if we if we kind of just stuck them on the roof they found out about them later we didn't really tell them about the program i don't think we'd be doing justice not only to the program but to our tenants um because it's a it's a cool amenity and initiative that um you know even with a suburban a primary primarily suburban office um you know portfolio we like to bring some urban initiatives because just because you don't work in CBD, Boston, you should be able to have some of these cool things that those, uh, you know, the downtown towers are getting. And that's our, that's our philosophy with cafes, health and wellness, any of those initiatives. And this was one that we really wanted to bring out of the city and kind of expand, um, you know, into, into the suburbs. So, um, all right, what else? So as I mentioned, we're, we're still trucking along with the, you know, a, a growth, um, to our portfolio in the next couple of years. Um, and we will look to expand this portfolio now that we've learned more about it. Um, we, we just hope we get all the honey that we're going <laughs> to, that we're promised because we got a lot of people waiting on it. Um, but uh, we're, we're reassured that we will and our, and our hives are doing well. What's that? Guaranteed. <laughs> it's guaranteed. That's right. That one is guaranteed. Um, you also get emails. Um, you can, read them at your leisure. Sometimes I have to go to Google and look up some of the words that they're talking about, but that's okay. It's, it's a chance to learn. Um, it's, it's an update of every time the beekeeper is there. They explain to you what's going on. They tell you about your queen, how things are going. Um, so there's, ne there's certainly not a lack of data um, and information that comes along with this program. So I think that that's pretty neat because again, it's expanding not only our knowledge on this, our tenants, and then eventually the community of why this is such a, you know, such a good program and not something I ever thought I'd be talking about in commercial real estate, but here we are. And I, I, I think it's, it's been a great one so far and one that we, we look to keep partnering with, um, you know, in the future. So that's it for me. Thank you for listening. And I'm happy to kind of flew through those, but happy to answer any questions, even if it's specific to, you know, granular details of how we roll things out or the honey or the bees, I'll, I'll probably, shift that to Noah, but <laughs> I, have, I have two, I have two questions. One's uh, business related and one is more technical. So that can help us transition back. Megan, what is your investment in the beehives relative to the other Fox Rock Cares programs? Um, so it's a good question. So we, as I mentioned, we've got like kind of five pillars that we, we focus on and we shift 
a percentage each year of, um, and we, at the beginning of the year, we try to determine our right, 50%, this year we're gonna do 50% to health and wellness, and then we're gonna split up the other among the four. This, it, it's minor, so I, you know, I'd have to get you the exact stats, but um, as I mentioned, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a large, across a portfolio, it, it was not a large investment at all. Um, this is the first kind of sustainable um, initiative that we've done this year under that kind of Fox Rock Cares um, you know, umbrella, and it's, it's certainly one that we want to expand and look to do more of. But I, can, I mean, I could get you, it's a very small percentage um, in terms of, if that's a, like in terms of an outlay of capital or, or a monetary investment, um, and, it's, and it's one in our sustainable area that I, I think we're, we're definitely going to um, look to do more. I'm not sure if that's answering the question, but um, you know, health and wellness has been, been a big one for us in the past. Education has been a big one. And I think we, we've got room to grow in our sustainable efforts, and this certainly helped. Great, thank you. Um, finally, Noah, I think this question is best answered by you. Matt Byrne is curious about the heat conditions that a flat EPDM roof surface might present for the bees relative to a position on the ground. Yeah, so one of the things that makes bees such remarkable creatures is, of course, they live in societies. Societies are really complex. What I'm really interested in about learning from bees is how they stay healthy. They don't have doctors, hospitals, nurses, um, pharmacies, and they do get pandemics. So we can learn a lot from them, but in part with thinking about buildings, HVAC costs, they have their own heating and cooling systems in a beehive. So if a beehive is hot, they can turn on the AC by pushing the hot air out and creating an air current. So as beekeepers, we'll leave two ventilation holes, one at the top and the bottoms to allow for that current. And in the winter, they'll even heat themselves up. So if you have a spot on a property that's too shady to grow a garden, consider pollinator habitat there because they'll cuddle together for warmth and eat honey for fuel, kind of like people do in the winter. So they can regulate their own temperatures and they do actually better on rooftops that seem super hot. I'll just add as we turn it over to Gautam as well. So we think about um, the urban heat island effect and we see a significant drop in temperature from green rooftops, rooftops with pollinator habitat compared to next door rooftops. I mean in the tens of degrees cooler. Um, so uh, it's a great question to think about and how we can even cool down our buildings by doing some more with the roof. Um, let's see, at this point, Megan, we'll ask you to unshare your screen. Sure. And uh, now we're going to shift the conversation a little bit. So uh, to the connection between bees and sustainability, of course, but also with a healthy human environment and with LEED certification in the U.S. Green Building Council, they've been such a great partner really supporting our agenda to save the bees. So I'll turn it over to you now, Gautam. Thank you so much, uh, Noah. And uh, I'm going to put my presentation up. Let me know if you folks can see it. Looks great. Okay. Firstly, good morning and good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you are located. I wanted to, uh, my name is Gautam Taraftar, and on behalf of the USGBC, I want, I would like to thank the host, Best Bees, to invite me to speak to all of you. Now, we are gathered here in an extraordinary time with a global pandemic not seen in the last 100 years. I really hope this is the once in a lifetime event for all of us. Now, having said that, uh, as we adjust to the new normal, let our actions be motivated by the thought that we have not inherited this planet from our forefathers, but we have borrowed it from our children. So let us continue to strive to make our planet a better place for the future generations. Now, what we do here at the USGBC helps us stay true to that goal. Uh, during the next few minutes, I will be touching upon the broad umbrella of opportunities which the USGBC presents and explore the connection to biophilia and on-site pollinator habitats. Okay, um, as the USGBC, at the USGBC, we remain committed to the four pillars of sustainability, health and wellness, resilience and equity. We continue to build upon the foundation of LEED with our uh, latest version, which is LEED V4.1. We are increasing our reach to our members and uh, by creating real impact within the space of existing buildings and communities, 
by focusing on project performance using LEAD. Now, with the pandemic surrounding us, the focus on health and wellness has come into sharp focus. One of the lesser known facts about LEAD is that 70% of all LEAD credits relate to health and wellness. Now, this is, I'll take a moment to talk about ARC, which is our technology platform with our performance focus. It helps you pursue the certification in these above categories, which is LEAD V4.1, certificate, recertification, and of course, LEAD Zero. Now, what is ARC, if you are wondering? Uh, ARC is set up to meet you where you are, right? Uh, it's, uh, as we, as we, it's important for us to provide an entry point for every project to get started. And now we have a suite of offerings uh, to help you do that. At the end of 2019, we launched ARC for All. Uh, that means that every project anywhere on this planet can use ARC at no cost. So welcome aboard. Uh, we also recognize that not everybody can achieve LEED certification. So we wanted to help those projects get started on their sustainability journey uh, on, and use an incremental approach towards lead. Uh, for this, we introduced this uh, category of uh, category level performance certificate. And of course, uh, if your uh, ultimate goal is lead, ARC can help you achieve lead certification or recertification for that matter by using your performance code. Now on the 25th anniversary of USGBC at GreenBuild in 2018, we launched the Living Standard program. At Living Standard, what we are doing is, the, uh, what, what does this mean if anybody is wondering? Well, a Living Standard indicates that an environment is healthy and safe for all of us who inhabit, to inhabit in, in this. It could vary from buildings to communities, to cities, uh, to entire nations. Uh, because a higher Living Standard is what every person on the on our planet deserves. And leading long and healthy lives is not a privilege. It's the right for everyone, regardless of their circumstances. Now, we have a lot to live up to, but it's within our reach. And if we are going to claim that reality, the time is now. As soon as you leave today, I would, I, I hope that you visit livingstandard.org where you can get stuck started by sharing your stories with us and sign up to be part of our new ongoing campaign. The poet uh, Wallace Stevens said, human nature is like water. It takes the shape of its container. Well, whether you define our container as this room, uh, as our city or the planet, we must all recognize that our nature and our future and I would say our fate is inextricably linked with what surrounds us, the world we live in, and one another. That's a message we can all understand. And if we realize how interconnected we are in our own daily lives, we can begin to build a new living standard that truly redefines what it means to be human. What I will ask you to do is to share your personal stories on this platform. I am personally very committed to bringing nature into our urban habitats. We all know the benefits of it and the need to take action. Now, this is the Lead for Communities program. It was launched uh, again, uh, three years back actually. Incredible as it may seem, there are over 100 cities and communities which have already been certified using this rating system across the world. Now our rating system is new, and while it has no specific reference to bees or related bee uh, honey production, nor I would say at this point in time any pilot credits that have been developed for that purpose, but the lead for community requirements are much broader. And so having beehives may not, while it may not meet all requirements of a credit, even though it can potentially be part of a credit in the lead for communities program. What we can do here is you can definitely try for lead innovation credits or pilot credits. Let me explain how. Uh, for instance, it is easy and tempting to see how on-site 
pollinator habitats can help the surrounding community, food production, uh, revenue generation, and community participation. So these aspects can be incorporated in the following credits, but each of those credit requirements would not be fully met by simply having beehives. These include the National Resources Conservation Restoration Credit, the Distribution Equity Credit, the Civic and Community in Engagement Credit, and there is a prerequisite which on, econ on economic growth. Now to explore this concept further, we are also working with uh, you know, Greater Toronto Airport to bring them on board to pursue the Lead for Communities program. Uh, the statement on their website says, why, why bees? Uh, with the BEEs capital Z, their first uh, honeybee apiary is situated along the trail near the Eto by Coke stormwater facility. It is cared for by a local beekeeper, and this beehive support food security and sustainable agriculture within the surrounding area. Okay, and action orientation is what I found in the resource that NOAA sent my way after the Earth Day event that they hosted earlier this year. It is titled A Guide to Lead Credits for Your On-Site Pollinator Habitat. This document was created by his organization and he asked me to confirm if the cited lead credits in this document are accurate and can be used as a reference for on-site pollinator habitat community. Well, I'm pleased to confirm that the answer is yes. Uh, there are six credits across these different categories listed above where, uh, you know, lead on-site pollinator habitats can be located within urban uh, environments and which can benefit uh, to get to their lead certification goals. Now, let me talk about a few properties which have, which are the embodiment of this uh, uh, biophilic design practice. With the grace and charm comparable to any of the stately embassies in the Washington DC area, this elegant 10 story Fairmont Washington DC Georgetown Hotel is considered one of the larger luxury properties located in the highly dense and competitive you know, hotel meeting and conference room uh, you know, sector which, is, which forms the Washington DC market. The district outranks all other states for lead certified space per capita. In addition to high saturation of green buildings in Washington DC, one of the main driving forces behind an overall hospitality sector push towards sustainability has been preference. We have seen these in request for proposals across the category where the planners, uh, where a meeting for planners and, uh, you know, and, and uh, are asking, what are your sustainability practices? So that's how you differentiate yourself from the rest. Now, from the crisp mar white marble floors to the, you know, the light flooded oasis of the lobby, the Four Diamond Hotel is nothing short of luxurious. And it might be the last place in town where you would expect to find honeybees. The bees are guests of the hotel's roof have, and they have become a symbol of Fairmont's dedication to the environment and sustainable practices. 105,000 Italian honeybees living in three beehives produce about 100 pounds of honey per year. And the chefs use it in the dishes and cocktails served at the Fairmont restaurant. Now, Addie's adding bees to its list of green enhancements was completed as part of an elaborate program they launched in 2016. Okay, on to the next one. What you are seeing here is um, the Atlanta Convention Center. Many of you may not know this, but this conference uh, center was the first state-owned convention center in the United States. Now they have emphasized environmental and social sustainability as a means of enhancing the lives of Georgians. This 4 million square foot uh, GWCC, as it is called, became the largest LEED certified convention center in the world when it achieved LEED certification way back in 2014. Along with three beehives, 4,000 solar panels, and an extensive waste management effort, the impact of GWCC has, on, has been on the community ranges from local food and material donations to literacy and education partnerships and job training and development. Now, as much as the hospitality industry has come to a standstill, GWCCA has embraced a new role. 
which which is it is serving as a facil facility for the care and recovery of Georgia's COVID-19 patients. Okay, folks who are living in New York City, sustainability industry, and who are familiar with the sustainability industry in New York City are familiar with the offices of Cook Fox Architect on uh, 250 West 57th Street. Their 13,000 square foot office was certified LEED commercial uh, platinum in 2017, and it features a walkout balcony which has been transformed into a flower garden and an on-site pollinator community. Uh, this, they harvest the bee and they give out these as keepsakes to hotel, uh, to their uh, special guests, I would say, for visiting their offices. They have three natural spaces as part of their office. The garden and hydroponic towers, uh, they are on the east terrace, are adjacent to an interior dining area, which, specialized, which is designed to facilitate creative and social communion and connection to nature. Across the studio, the West Terrace, a landscape of native trees, wildflowers, sedums, and grasses incorporate outdoor meeting areas. With a third viewing garden, the three terrace, terraces incorporate plants and soil transplanted from their former studio, continuing a decade of care for the former rooftop garden. As Rick Cook, uh, who is an, uh, an owner architect says, they were obsessed with the idea of how to express biophilic design and come back to the prospect of, uh, to the concept rather of prospect and refuge. What they mean by prospect and refuge is a space where you can feel safe, but you can get prospect out in the city or, and the space. This interaction between their office space and the natural habitat has won them several awards, among them the Stephen R. Keller Biophilic Design Award in 2017. Now, while cities across the globe work to flatten the COVID-19 curve and return to some sense of normalcy, we must face a new reality. Uh, the world we return to might not look like nothing we have left behind. Uh, the, the impact of the global COVID-19 pandemic will be felt for years to come on the economy, on people, and on our way of life. 50% of the world's population has already been living below the poverty line. And the IMF estimates that in 2020, 2021 alone, the cumulative GDP loss from this pandemic would be around $9 trillion. It is no secret that the most vulnerable amongst us will feel the gravest impacts. We are going to have extraordinary mental, physical, and financial repercussions in nearly every part of society. Remaining resilient, both in business and life, will require every industry and individual to adapt at a pace we might have never seen or have thought possible. But what lies ahead of us is also a responsibility for us to design a more resilient future. During the, I would say during the week of 515, which is what now, six weeks now, the USGBC announced a series of actions and priorities which will support the global recovery effort and leverage the power of our community to shape a healthier future for all. You can read the full list here, but uh, I wanted to note a few things for all of you. We will make a series of upgrades to LEAD V4.1, which will be made available to project teams in August of this year. And on an emergency basis, we will release LEAD pilot credits to support uh, social distancing, non-toxic, uh, surface cleaning and quality and infection monitoring. We will conduct research uh, reports to help our community understand broader trends within the market and uh, opportunities to advance our new vision. This includes the read the lead ROI um, study to demonstrate both return on investment and impact. Healthy people in healthy places equals a healthy economy. This is our new timely relevant and necessary vision. We hope you will join us to make it a reality. In keeping with our commitment, the USGBC is hosting a two-day workshop over August 4 and 5, titled the Healthy Economy Forum. It will be in the format of presentations and Q&A from speakers. I would encourage you to submit your ideas for uh, this program, and please do attend this event uh, if you can. On June 9th, uh, just earlier this month, the USGBC launched a call for proposals for LEED. 
because continuous improvement has always been our hallmark. With each new version of this rating system, we are challenging the building sector to be more resource efficient and sustainable, but also at the same time to evolve to meet the market where it, where it is. Today, we find ourselves in the period of change. And as we look forward, the dedication to flexibility remains and we are activating one of the newest tools in the lead development process, the call for proposals to ensure that lead addresses the urgency of today while still planning for tomorrow. We are in this together. We hope that you will join us and continue to participate in strengthening Lead V4.1 and in advancing our vision of healthy people in healthy places for a healthy economy. Lastly, we want your feedback. The programming we offer is based on what you have expressed a desire to learn from, from us. We want to keep the dialogue going and we appreciate your feedback. Thank you very much. Back to you, Noah. That's great. Got them. Thank you so much. And uh, if you'll unshare your screen here, then I will um, switch this over to my shared screen. There are so many examples that you've just shared that really hit home for me. We only have a couple minutes left. It's flown by. So what I want to do is to build on those so that we can leave with a purpose of scale here and a sense that with the information that we've shared, that folks are really able to kind of process this maybe in the context of National Pollinator Week with uh, trying to feel empowered with what to do. And even if you have one property or no properties or just at home, or many, you can do something at any level. So what I want to take from your talk, Gautam, is to think about your example with the Fairmont Hotel at property in DC to share, uh, you know, we've had some wonderful examples here. We're looking at the Fairmont Copley Plaza Hotel in Boston, where they've done some great stuff. These are uh, images of a lower interfacing rooftop that the guest rooms look into. The guest rooms don't have any screens on the window. So as Megan was saying, when people are a little bit afraid of bees, well, uh, uh, Fairmont's a great example when they have the guests looking right at the beehives, looking right onto the pollinator habitat. You see in the front, you've got a chef's herb garden. So that goes right to the restaurants and bars. So that has a new product, a new flair, bringing guests in. The back left is habitat for native bees. It's often called a bee hotel. So we've been talking a lot about honeybees, but that's just a few of 200,000 species of pollinators. So nesting habitats in the back left, and of course the back right is the honey production. Fairmont Hotels has a website for their dedication to bees worldwide. So look them up online, Fairmont Bees, to learn more. We do so much research, as Megan mentioned, each beehive is a NASA data point. So NASA looks at climate change measures from satellites. And now with each beehive that has a scientific a component, we're turning properties into data points. So building off of the lead work that Gutham has shared so much with looking into communities, now we can look even further into our climate, into space by providing data and really engaging with the larger mission at hand. Lastly, I want to share and build off of these airport examples. We've seen uh, beehives at airports in St. Louis, Chicago, Seattle, um, not just here in Toronto. So whether you've got a building, a rooftop, grounds, extra space, we've worked with Toyota for all of their um, parts manufacturing facilities where they've got beehives. Anytime you've got any opportunity, consider what more could be done. Even if you don't have any opportunities, think about guerrilla gardening. Take a handful of native seeds and throw them in an abandoned property property and just know that anybody of any age, ability, background can make a small uh, difference with a big impact. So thanks again. We've got some more questions in here and I think we actually might have time to take one. Um, so Shelly, I'll turn this over to you and maybe there was a question um, for, for Gutham that we passed over that you might want to share. Sure. So there's one question from Matthew Callahan for commercial building owners. Are there any restrictions on potential locations? I'm assuming he means for beehives specifically, meaning building height, city versus suburban, et cetera. Maybe that's a question that you, Noah, and Gautam can answer in tandem. Hmm. This is Gautam. I'm not aware of any restrictions as such. Um, there is wide variety of literature which is available, uh, you know, which I'm sure Noah would be happy to share. This is the, he has got a builder, this tremendous resource, which um, I believe he will be sharing as part of the giveaway from this or maybe later on to everyone. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, I think we'll close it on this idea of global impact at your local level, your local community is so important. So check out your local community's regulations and reach out to us, um, bestbees.com, Fox Rock Properties, USGBC. We'd be happy to answer uh, any questions or help you uh, with a guide to finding out some more information. So thanks again to everybody for joining. We're just so grateful for your attendance. And Guttam and Megan, thank you. And Shelly as well. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.